Greetings, greetings all my dreamers and dreamettes, it's your boy Mickey Fenty, aka Mickey Made It. If you're new to this channel, you know what to do to this channel, subscribe right now. Also, if you want to support the brand, it's Inspired by Dreams dot shop. It's a preppy streetwear brand. We have everything. Add some to your closet, you know, dress outside of the box. Okay, today's episode, this is a very special episode because I want everybody just to realize that in every culture... There's always some back and forth bickering, who's this, who's that, and just trying to figure out the differences that we are, all have. I'm telling you, we have to start sticking to our similarities. Today's episode is the difference between white people and Caucasian people. I know that's going to trick a lot of people, but let's get it. Mickey made it. Mickey made what you made, Mickey. Forget about the way it used to be. This is not a damn democracy. We are in a state of emergency, and my word is law. Oh, white people don't have any culture. They don't have any culture. Okay, have you ever been in a room full of Caucasians and you hear, dun, 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 dun. let's go, girl. I hate to be that bitch, but I'm about to be that bitch. As a Georgian, it really grinds my years when like a white person, full on, refers to themselves as Caucasian. I'm sorry, do you know where the Kafkas is? The Caucasus mountain region? If you don't, let me educate you. It's between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, including a bit of Russia, Georgia, in our native tongue we call it Sakartvelo, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and other places. So if your family didn't originate from there, or isn't from there, you're probably not Caucasian, you're just- And real quick, I want you guys to leave a comment down below if you guys can tell the difference. It's white. Caucasian isn't a term for you to use to feel better about being white. It doesn't mean white, but make it sound ethnic. Matter of fact, that's kind of annoying. It's like you're erasing the history, the struggles, the culture and traditions of my people. Matter of fact, our people are considered Western Asian North African. That is our origin. So please educate yourself before calling yourself Caucasian. It's not the same. You can't look at me and tell me that because I'm Italian, I'm not white. I am, I, I am as white as it gets. Ah, uh, the age old question of whether Italians are white. I think you mean Italian Americans before the Italians come for us. We mean Americans with Italian ancestry and heritage. So I too am an Italian American. My parents were both born in Italy and they immigrated at different points in their lives. They settled in the Bronx in New York I was born there, but now I, ironically, live in Italy. And the question seems like a fairly simple and obvious one, right? I mean, you're white, I'm obviously white. We fill out white or Caucasian on all of our forms in the US. But a hefty portion of the Italian American community does not consider themselves white. And there are reasons for it and a lot of nuance in this conversation. So let's start at the beginning. Italian immigration to the US basically can be divided into two waves, although there's kind of a third wave happening right now, but we'll just focus on the first two. That first wave, when four million Italians went over to the US, occurred between 1880 and 1920, and it mostly comprised of wealthy Northern Italians. So not only did they have more money, more education, but they also looked different. They had lighter features, lighter skin, lighter hair, lighter eyes very different from the southern Italian immigrants who immigrated at the turn of the century. These Italians were much darker, they were also much poorer, they were farmers, laborers, peasants, and they were not treated the same way as their northern counterparts were treated in the United States for obvious reasons. They did the jobs that a lot of Americans didn't want to do, sound familiar, and in fact, a lot of them did not intend staying permanently in the United States, and in the end, like 30 to 50% of them actually ended up going back home to Italy. But the ones who stayed and stuck it out spoke in their local dialects, right? So they really established communities in the United States using their local dialect because at that time, the Italian language hadn't been standardized across Italy. That happened with the advent of Italian TV in 1954. 
So they only spoke dialect, again, because they were poor, again, because they didn't go to school, didn't have an education. So they could only do these manual jobs, this manual labor, right? So they worked for steel mills, they worked for coal mines, as masons, as bricklayers. Shout out to my Calabrese nonno who arrived with my mom and her family in 1970 in New York City and he helped build the city's infrastructure as a bricklayer. Now the second wave of Italian immigration happened after World War II, again for obvious reasons. And this lasted up until about 1970, 600,000 mostly southern Italian immigrants arrived in the US. These Italians clung tightly to not only their cultural identity, but their regional one too. So, who was from Campania? Who was from Calabria? Who was from Sicily? And Sicily is very particular because Sicily has a unique history and cultural positioning as a sort of crossroads between Africa and Europe. This is why many Sicilians, Sicilian Americans, are darker with curly hair. It's also why they identify first as Sicilian and then Italian comes after. And it's these recent Italians and their grandchildren and children who feel very closely connected to Italy and Italian culture. Even if they've been in the US for 50, 60, 70 years now, they still feel that link compared to the descendants of Italian immigrants who arrived in the US in like 1880, 1890. And this is especially true for cities like New York where first generation Americans like me grew up with immigrant parents and grandparents and we either grew up speaking Italian or we thought we grew up speaking Italian but in reality we were speaking the dialect of our family. So we were trying to mimic our family's regional dialect and when we went to school and learned actual Italian we were in for a rude awakening. So slowly but surely, these Italians ascended the socioeconomic ladder, right? They joined the American middle class. They were making a lot of money, they had success, they were proud of it, they achieved the American dream. And their politics soon started to mirror that change. In fact, many of them became MAGA in 2016 and 2020, and unfortunately, a lot of them are still today MAGA. So while we successfully morphed into white people in modern day American society, our ancestors were not considered white back in Italy. In fact, the Northern Italians looked down upon the Southern Italians, again, because they were poorer, because they were darker. So they were considered, the Southerners, as subhuman, animal almost. And around the same time that that second wave of immigration was happening in the US, Southern Italians were also emigrating to the north of Italy. And the Northerners were very upset about this because, again, there was a lot of tension. And they also complained that the Southerners were stealing their jobs. History always repeats itself, doesn't it? So the Southern Italians were met with the same disdain and discrimination as their neighbors were in the United States back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. This caused a lot of friction that unfortunately still exists today, and it's because Italy as a whole has never really grappled with its issues of classism, colorism, and especially racism. It also has never truly addressed its colonial fascist past either. The conversations that we've been having about race and racism in the United States dating back to the civil rights movement and more recently, forcefully, since 2020, are simply not happening here. In fact, I don't think there are many countries who are where the United States is right now on the subject. Here in Italy, even mentioning the word race or racism is like, oh my god, like it's considered taboo here because Italians tend to say shit like, oh, well, the only race is the human race, which I still fail to understand given that Italy has been an immigrant nation for decades. Italy is no longer the Italy that our ancestors left many, many moons ago. The demographics have been changing for a long time now. Therefore, Italians should start having conversations on what racism is, okay? Whether racism exists here in this country. Surprise, it does. I mean, starting from the 60s when students and workers from Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia, all former Italian colonies, by the way, started to arrive in Italy, 
things started to change a little bit. Also, there was an influx of Northern Africans coming into Italy as well in search of work, right? In the 80s, I think a lot of Tunisians were hired to work as fishermen in Sicily. And in the early 1900s, it was actually the opposite. Sicilians were going to Tunisia for work. Then also in the 80s, Latin Americans fleeing economic and political instability in their countries started to arrive in mass in Italy and also Spain, actually. So there are huge communities of Ecuadorians, Peruvians, Brazilians in Italy. Throughout the 90s, international immigration to Italy continued and there was a turning point in 1991 when over 20,000 Albanian refugees arrived in the port of Bari because they were escaping a communist dictatorship. And that was the first of many different waves of many different immigrants to the shores of Italy. And in 2001, uh, which marked a very significant time in Italian history. The census recorded more than a million foreigners living in Italy for the very first time. The issue of immigration also dominated for the very first time the discourse of election campaigns, and I believe Berlusconi is partly to blame for that. And ever since, it's remained a hot-button issue for both politicians and the public alike, except the former, especially those on the far right, use immigration as a fear-mongering tactic, just like those in the United States. Despite what far-right political leaders in Italy believe, though, immigration in Italy is growing, and it will only continue to grow due to the numerous political and economic conflicts and crises around the world. Other than Albania, which is number two, the top origin countries in Italy are Romania, number one, Morocco, China, Ukraine, and the Philippines. I'm reading them right now because I didn't want to mess those up. All of these people have established roots, livelihoods, and families here in Italy, and oftentimes their grandchildren and children are not considered Italian because number one, the law states that anyone born to foreign parents are not considered Italian until the age of 18 when they can apply for Italian citizenship and a passport. And number two, because Italians tend to otherize people who look different from them. These people look different, they may talk different, they have different religions and maybe different family traditions. People who could be white or white passing in the US do not have that privilege often here in Italy. So Italians, racist Italians, are really struggling with the fact that Italy is becoming a multi-ethnic and multicultural country. So back to the question, are Italians white? Where are the most beautiful women from? In the 1800s, there was one universal answer for this, and that was Caucasian women. And no, Caucasian doesn't mean white, it means women from this area. They were praised for never looking tired, always looking beautiful and lively. And their best secret is something modern diet deprives us of. What would you think if I told you that I look white, but I'm not white? A year ago, I made a video about this, and it got so much backlash. Everybody had all these opinions, different perspectives, all that good stuff. What I meant was that white, as in Caucasian, I'm not directly Caucasian. I just look Caucasian. I'm actually a mixed little baby. I'm Cuban Chinese. I am more Cuban than I am Chinese, and there are Cubans that look like me. I've just been thinking about that video the last couple days, and I thought I should bring it to light again for some reason. Will I get more backlash for it? I bet you I will. But I want to know your thoughts about it. I think the biggest American misconception about Russians and Eastern Europeans is calling them Caucasians. I don't know who and for what reason call Eastern Europeans Caucasians, but Caucasians are more like Arabic looking people. They are opposite of what Eastern European people look like. Caucasians are Georgian, Chechen people, Kabardin people. I will attach some pictures. Usually Caucasians have dark hair, dark eyes, and darker skin tones. Or like the more 10 to 10 right away. Because those are the people that living mostly in mountain or seaside areas. There are around 60 variations of Caucasian ethnicities and a lot of them located in Russia. But they have different ethnic type that Americans are referring to. And they have the best food on planet Earth. So if you have a chance to go to Georgian restaurant, you will experience the best cheese pizza. It's like a closed cheese pizza you will ever, ever taste. I want to clarify some things about my video and why not to use the term Caucasian. Caucasians are a real group of people that come from the Caucasus in the Middle East and have faced oppression throughout history and especially now with Russia. 
a scientist decided that Caucasians were the most beautiful people, and white people automatically assumed that that meant them. White people, especially European Americans, appropriated the term because of white supremacy. In short, the term's not racist if you're using it to describe people from the Caucasus, but if you're not, it's because of white supremacy. Can we talk about how miserable white people are for a second? Like, you know that white people are miserable, right? Like, have you ever looked a white person in the eye, even if they're like a big mental health person? You just look deep down and you're like, brother, you are not happy at all. And truly, it breaks my heart. But one reason, I think, one of the main reasons is that a lot of white people, a lot of us are really unhappy and miserable is because we lack internal congruence. Now, congruence is a concept we learned early in grad school to help people heal. And congruence is basically internal alignment. Values and actions are on the same page, right? Like we accept every part of ourselves. We feel peace, security in who we are, congruence. And no matter how hard you try, you can never find internal congruence if you're not congruent with the world around you. If you're not understanding what's real and seeing reality and affirming what's true. So like white people who deny patriarchy and capitalism's negative effect and oppression of the world and genocide that's happening around the world, like that's incongruent with reality. That is going to have an effect on us internally because to deny what's happening in real time we have to deny certain parts of us, certain emotions, certain thoughts that come up. And the more we run for that, the more incongruent and separate we feel, the more dissonance that comes, the more miserable we are. And a lot of times we're not actually dealing with our own pain and our own reality because we're all suffering under capitalism and white supremacy. Like it affects us different ways, in intersectionality, but like it affects us white people too. You don't think a stormtrooper in the fucking Star Wars movies hates his life? You don't think he hates being bossed around all the time? You don't think poor white people living in the empire, like in a city walls, like in a Game of Thrones, like you don't think that they're miserable under it, even though they're not miserable the most? To be congruent inside, to not be miserable anymore, it takes accepting the realities of the world, seeing how those toxic systems affect us, and then moving to actually be congruent. Because deep down, humanity has goodness at its center. So yeah, white people, we're miserable because we're not congruent, because we're denying the realities of the world, and thus denying ourselves. Are we gonna talk about how disappointing it is that a Syrian person, a Swana person, in the past, like in the 80s, went out of their way to be considered a white person so they could get equal treatment as a white person because they were not. And now in Western society, in the US, Middle Eastern people are considered white because that's annoying. It's annoying because <laughs> that benefits white supremacy, clearly, because it makes white people white American or whatever the fuck think there's more of them no and it's literally also cultural erasure because when we talk about whiteness in the states or in the western world we're very much talking about a specific type of white person and you can't convince me otherwise whiteness is also cultural and class wise all i can say is culture can be confusing at times but but we gotta get out of this. We all are humans and we all have our differences. Let's try to stick to our similarities. That's what that's what I usually say. And you guys let me know down below if you know the difference between a white person and a Caucasian person. Until next time, it's your boy Mickey Fenty, aka Mickey Made It. If you're new to this channel, you know what to do to this channel. Subscribe.